Good morning, everybody. Um, so yeah, uh, I, what I want to do is talk about uh, furniture joinery. Uh, my interest is pre-industrial workmanship. Uh, so it's sort of the, the process side of things, the practice side of things, as opposed to uh, just the finished product. I'm interested in this way of working. Um, so what I want to do is look at uh, pre-industrial joinery. Uh, and you know, I, I would imagine that many of you, almost all of you, if not all of you, have already cut mortise and tendon joinery before. So that's not a new topic. And I'm aware of that. Um, but what I want to do is I want to look at, I want to walk through that process from a pre-industrial perspective to think about it. If you didn't have machines, if you weren't thinking from a machine production standpoint, how would you approach this material? Especially when, you know, the, each piece is prepped by hand and it's, so it's not perfectly square. So what kind of factors do you have to uh, account for? How do you want to uh, approach this so that you know you're going to have a nice tight joint? where it matters. So we'll talk about that, where it matters and where it doesn't matter. Um, so uh, one thing I wanna do is just talk about what I'm, I'm, I'm covering here. Um, and this is my latest book uh, called Joined, A Bench Guide to Furniture Joinery. And it's just designed to look at uh, mortise and tenon joinery through and half blind dovetails, rabbits, dados, just basic, uh, basic joinery, but it's all laid out in a, sort of a step uh, by step thing with lots of little commentary in the side. So it's, it's not designed to be, you know, you sit down in your armchair and you just read it and enjoy it. It's designed to be set on your bench. You can lay the thing out flat and do the joinery right next to it. So that's what it's designed to be. It's a practical book that will be full of coffee stains and dents and all those sorts of things full of sawdust when you shake it out. That's the, that's the goal of this book. So that's kind of what I want to walk through. Um, and the whole point, what I found is um, it's, it's, not, I, you can teach someone how to saw, you can teach someone how to use a chisel carefully, and that's one set of skills. But what I've found is most of the classes I've taught, um, most of my students have done those particular operations before. Maybe they want to improve at them. I sure do. We all want to get better at everything we do. Um, but what I found is the real hang up, the real hitch that almost everybody stumbles over is the idea of reference surfaces or primary surfaces and secondary surfaces. Um, and so that to me, in my understanding, that is what unlocks pre-industrial workmanship. If you really have a firm grasp on this concept, everything will make so much more sense and you can see where you can uh, expedite the work. It's not shortcutting, it's not cheating, it's just expediting areas that will not be seen. Um, so I don't know if there's any way to poll, but typically what I do uh, when I have a big group of people is I'm going to ask, you know, how many people have, have seen pre-industrial work before? And I don't mean the, the outside when you walk into a museum, uh, you know, exhibit and you see all of this gorgeous Philadelphia carved uh, high boy and all that kind of stuff that I think a lot of us have seen. But how many of you have crawled underneath it? or seen the drawers taken out, or seen it on the backside. Because um, what was interesting to me is what you'll find is it particularly, it's all around the world, um, but especially in areas that were less um, guild controlled, like in England, the guild system was very intense and, and controlled on all the secondary surfaces. So typically English uh, pre-industrial furniture is still, I would say comparatively smooth and regular on the inside. As soon as you get outside of guild systems is a totally different way of approaching it. Um, and so for those of us, you know, who are interested in American furniture, what's interesting is I had a few different uh, opportunities, Early American Industries Association, SAPFM, um, some, some research grants to be able to go look into museums. So I had been doing antique furniture conservation um, and had seen a bunch of furniture taken apart and it looked pretty rough on the inside. But I wasn't totally positive that maybe this is just country furniture. Maybe this is not high style furniture. Um, but those, those uh, opportunities to go look at um, Winterthur Museum, the Yale Furniture Study, uh, Old Sturbridge Village, to be able to see really high, high level work in person. And they said, here, take the drawers out, look at this. I realized, holy smokes, it's all like this. Um, I had an opportunity to spend um, a week with Charlie Hummel at the Winterthur Museum. And the two of us were walking through and we were pulling stuff out of the Winterthur Museum. The stuff that you only drool to look at pictures. 
and it's all hatchet marks on the underside and really rough. So all that is to illustrate, wow, okay. So how do you do really tight joinery with that kind of surface? How do you start? How do you reference that? How do you use that in a way that's effective and looks so immaculate on the outside? And those are the things I wanna explore. Um, first, what I wanna do is I have um, a few uh, pieces of period work. Um, I, I got this in a, I bought a big stack of lumber, uh, a lifetime supply of lumber from somebody um, or his estate rather. Uh, he passed away. He was a friend of mine and he had a huge inventory of lumber. Um, and so I purchased that from the estate. And in the mix of it, there were a few different uh, random pieces of furniture. Uh, so they're really great to hold on to. I don't know where this table went, but it was a table at one point. Um, and this is what I want to show you is how this works. So this is, you know, a table rail. You can see the tendons here. And you can see all this. So obviously here's the, the show side, here's the finish on it, and it's nice and smooth. If you haven't looked for tool marks before, what you're gonna wanna do is get a flashlight. And you can see from the window light on the side and this light here, you can see the surface, right? So this low raking light is how you see all of the pre-industrial fingerprints or tool marks. Um, if, you've, if you've ever read any um, uh, painting, critique any sort of painting scholars and they analyze and they talk about the brush strokes of the master and they start drawing implications or interpretations from the the manner in which the brush strokes were made um, that sounds sort of mystical um, but what I have found and that and to me that does sound like I don't understand that however in tool marks any of us who have used hand tools what happens when you look really close at these tool marks you can see when the tool stutters, when it's used aggressively, when it's calm and gentle, and you start to see how this person was working. And you can kind of, in your mind's eye, envision what it took to actually make that cut and what it took to do pre-industrial work then. So it's sort of this investigative research process, it's reverse engineering, looking at the finished product, trying to analyze the tool marks, reproduce the tool marks and say, wow, that was, really hasty work that was really quick right here oh and I can see this area is really smooth and careful so what you'll see I'm not sure how well this is going to show up but um, you can see see the undulations across the surface here um, that's I think as best as I can do in person it's uh, clear as day you can see how that's not smooth that's from the four plane f-o-r-e or a jack plane um, and so the, the, the camber on the cutting iron is quite heavy. It's not extreme, it's not a caricature, but it's just, it, it is a rounded iron. So this is designed to take big, heavy cuts and uh, pre-industrial work, this is typical. In fact, even on, I will say, even shaker furniture, um, the, the faces, the drawer faces on shaker furniture, uh, it probably, it might've been a smoothing plane, but it had a really, really heavy camber. It looked like this, but it just was painted red. So even shaker furniture that has this mysticism, sort of we, we build it into our idea of pre-industrial shaker kind of work. Um, nope, the hand tool work they did looks just like all of this. So what we're gonna look at is um, the insides uh, are sometimes hatchet marks, or they are four plane marks. And it's particularly in American work, that's it, no further. All you wanna do is get, you know, it'd be not ideal to have, you know, a rough sawn surface that you're gonna catch your, your pants on. But even sometimes uh, the inside rail of tables, it's just straight from the sawmill. There is no planing on the inside sometimes. Um, the, the only planing that happens is very rough. So you'll see there's also, let's see if I can, highlight it. I don't think so, but there's a lot of tear out right here at the very end. So tear out, all that stuff is normal. That is normal, typical American period furniture. In fact, I was talking with Pat Kane at the Yale University Art Gallery, and she was telling me that this kind of thing or uh, uh, chairs, the undersides of the, um, the, stretcher, the, the um, stretchers, if she doesn't see riving marks or tear out, she assumes it's a fake. She assumes it's not a real period chair because 
period chairs are all, they have riving marks because those pieces were split really close to final dimension. And once, when you're turning it, what happens is you work down to dimension, down to dimension until you, you have the low spot, the valley just on one side. And that's just the side you turn to the inside or, or down. Um, so that's just a pre-industrial mindset. Uh, it's economy of labor is uh, sometimes what it's called. Um, but it's not it's the point, of course, somebody in the 17th, 18th century was not celebrating this. They didn't think this was cool, <laughs> right? They weren't excited about it. They just thought it was practical. It's the same reason we would just, if we're building something utilitarian or it's the back of something, we'd say, just get a piece of plywood, stick it on there. It'll be fine, right? That's, that's, this, this is what you're looking at. This is pre-industrial plywood, if that makes sense. It's just approaching it in a very practical way. So how do you then lay out nice tight joinery with hewn pieces. Um, the key is to understand primary and secondary surfaces. So the outside face is the primary surface or the reference face. And every time you're using a square, it's gonna go off of this face. So what I do it, it, when I tell my students is you have to make sure when I'm teaching a class, make sure the inside of your rail is rough and that there's tear out all over it. Because when you pick it up and you don't have finish on one side, you have a smooth side and you have a rough side. So if you, if you have any doubts about which side is the outside face, you just got to pick it up and go, oh, wow, okay. I know exactly what my reference face is. That also helps because then when you start grabbing when you grab it, uh, your gauge, your marking gauge, and you put it on there, you're going it, to, it's burned into your mind. You're not going to put that on an axe hewn surface, <laughs> right? Or a four plane surface. You're going to put that on the smooth surface. So that's just a way that, that I find it helps people rather than writing face and inside or whatever marking system you have, rather than writing that on it, you just let the tool marks tell you what is the inside and the outside. Um, and so that's not why they did it, I think, primarily. Uh, it was fast, but I find it to be really handy. And every time I have the inside smooth and the outside smooth, it's easy to get turned around. So it does have practical value. And so I do tell my students, I had one situation, uh, a student didn't want to do that. He wanted it smooth and he was getting turned around with his joinery. And I picked it up and said, okay, so that's fine. Just which side is the, the show face? I'm, I'm a little confused. And he picked it up and he's like, um, and he wasn't sure. And so that's what happens if you have a little pencil mark and you accidentally, you know, plane it off or something, you're all turned around. So you got to have it rough. If you're thinking pre-industrial, you want to have it rough on the inside. Um, so what that means is everything, you're establishing one flat plane that is at what everything is built off of. So on the inside, this inside wall can vary in thickness and not be square and whatever because that's all extra tangential material in fact look at look at this one to illustrate this so i have a table rail here here's another one from that collection so here's the show face painted piece nice and smooth obviously it's got grime all over it but it was plain smooth and then you get on the inside and you see this little shoulder here, right? Oh, you can see a bunch of tear out right down here. So a little shoulder, but look at the other side. There's no shoulder here, no shoulder at all. Now, why would that be? Is it because the tendons are different size? No, it's because the board went from thick down to thinner, but it doesn't matter because everything beyond the tenon is irrelevant. Does that make sense? So um, we'll look at that with layout, how you can factor that in. So it's show face to the tenon thickness and nothing else matters. Nothing else is functional. It doesn't matter if it's an inch thick or if it's nothing because uh, we're not using that material. So that's how you can take um, you know, a regularly sawn material and all you have to do is clean up a face and you're good to go because you don't care if the, the boards that you're using are all different thickness. It doesn't, it doesn't matter at all. So that's what we're gonna look at. But how do we do this then? If we're thinking about, but, but doesn't, I've seen pre-industrial joinery and I know it's all nice and tight. I've seen it, I've looked at it. So how do you make sure that it's all tight? And the key 
uh, let's find the best example. The key here is, okay, so here's your show face. Here's the inside face, that's all rough. I'm gonna try to hold this up. So you see the shoulder here? If I put a square in that, it is a little hard to see. Um, see, this is the show face I'm referencing off of. See where it's touching right at the outside? I'm trying to, see. okay, so it's touching right at the outside. And then the shoulder is actually undercut. It's not 90 degrees, right? So it's undercut there on the show face. So the, the front, and look at the back. You see that? It is undercut, but it's just below. It's not even on the same line. It's just cut way back. So the whole idea with that is you're taking this back piece, the inside, and you're just making it completely irrelevant. You're just taking it out of the equation altogether. So this never touches. It never touches the leg. The only thing that, the first thing that's touching the leg is this front edge. And even that then is undercut from there so that you're not gonna be hung up on anything. So the reason that's also really valuable is because remember in a pre-industrial mindset, you've also prepped the leg stock by hand. And rather than taking a machinist square and checking all sides and making sure they're all perfectly 90 degrees and you have 90 degree shoulders so everything can touch nice and tight and so that you don't have a gap, you just assume nothing's 90 degrees <laughs> and you roll with it. And you say, so therefore, I'm gonna prioritize all of my, my uh, integrity of my joint right here, all of the, the visual tightness integrity right here, and then just make everything else undercut, back cut away, so I know I'm not gonna get hung up. And so that's really great because then it, it assists with fitting. I don't know how many of you have spent time with when everything is 90 degrees and you start test fitting, and oh, I still got a gap in the front and oh, it's touching back here. And then you, you know, you get your shoulder plane and you take it on the inside. And this whole thing is like, forget all that. Just cut it shorter in the back, right? So that's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be walking through that. What I have found is even if you don't want to, uh, you know, work completely just with hand tools and to do all of this massive undercutting and all that kind of stuff, what it does do is it, it helps you understand what's actually going on with joinery so that if you are doing with machines, you can see where it's important, where it has to fit and where it doesn't have to fit. Um, and so for me, uh, the reason I'm, I work this way is I don't, I don't really enjoy using machinery. Um, I, I really enjoy using hand tools. And so I'm trying to maximize the amount of time I can use hand tools. And I found for me, uh, I don't, I don't want any machinery. So I, I enjoy, you know, ripping molding. Uh, I don't, I'm not running a factory, so I don't have that much molding I'm doing. And in the same way that other people would like to go for a hike or something, or, you know, go for a run, I'd rather rip molding. I just think it's fun. I think woodworking is a blast and I want to do more of it. So that's, that's my, my logic. And why am I doing it this way? Why would I approach it this way? And so for me, it's fun and, and full of joy, but I also don't want to, try to pretend like I am a machine because I'm not a machine and you guys aren't machines, you know? So if you're going to use hand tools, you got to use the standards of people who used hand tools all throughout human history. That's my, my take on it. Um, you're free to, to work more precise, but I just, I just find it we're very inefficient machines if we're going to try to be machines. So what I want to do is walk through this joint because it's a really vivid illustration of all these principles. And then you'll be able to, um, you can ask questions as I'm going through that and say, hold on, what did you just reference off of or why are you doing it this way? Um, and you'll see each step, you'll have to be thinking all the time, what's the show surface? What's the secondary surface? Um, the other principle uh, before I do that, I, I wanna talk about is, um, I haven't heard anybody use these words. I just try to come up with terminology that explains it. But I often think about, sacred surfaces or sacred lines and you know the word sacred means set apart or special right so what i am thinking about is okay none of this is sacred i don't care if i scratch it i don't care if there's a pencil line i don't care whatever this back shoulder not sacred doesn't matter what is sacred is this surface i don't want to scratch that because that's what's going to be seen in the, the final uh, assembly and this 
edge, this shoulder is sacred, right? The thickness of this, and sacred is just a visual thing for me. So of course I want the right thickness, but I don't care if I have a scratch on it, <laughs> obviously, right? And I don't care that you see on the edge of the tenons, see how they're chamfered. Nobody measured that out. Nobody said, okay, it's gonna be exactly a quarter inch by a quarter inch, and then they're pairing it. They're just <laughs> two little cuts and then they moved on. Cause that's not sacred. You know, they're not concerned about that. So that's another principle. It's primary and secondary surfaces or the, the reference and the non-reference surface and sacred surfaces or non-sacred or you know maybe you could say profane <laughs> surfaces and typically it is pretty profane i think um does anyone have any questions before i start demonstrating this and walking through each step and maybe maybe tony if you see some questions uh pop up if you want to just sort of read them to me as I'm going, because I'll probably miss that. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll just get started. And then Tony, uh, let me know if you have, if there are any questions from people. Yeah, then... I, I told everybody they could unmute with the space bar, but that wasn't working for me. So, um, okay. <laughs> uh, at any rate, um, so everybody's I'm talking right now. I'm monitoring the chat. And so far there's uh, nothing in the chat screen. Okay. I will, uh, continue to monitor that, or if somebody wants to just shout out. Yep. Uh, that's probably Sounds okay. good. So, oh, I do see someone from Mike. Do you want to read that one? Do we get that question from Mike? Mike, go ahead with your question. I, I just saw a little pop-up. Ah, oh, there it is. Okay. This is from Stephen to everyone. I sometimes use the inside non-show side as the reference surface when joinery is there, such as a chest of drawers. How do you do that? Um, well, there may be some situation in which you... you in your construction, you want to be able to use both surfaces as reference surfaces. In that case, it's very important that everything is, ex is dead on exactly uh, measured. Um, however, what I have found in pre-industrial work, when you start kind of reverse engineering, how is this thing put together? The reference surfaces are almost always on the outside. Everything is referenced from that. And you'll see the inside is all uneven and rough. Um, so I'll walk through that. I mean, when and anything I've built, I've never used the inside as the reference surface. Um, there may be a situation someone's thinking of that you, you have to do that, but um, I've never I've never approached it that way or thought of it that it has to be the inside surfaces. I always use um, the outside surface as the reference surface. Okay, question from Mike. If you were restoring a piece, would you duplicate the same surface variations in your restoration? Um, not, no, uh, but not because basically there are different mindsets about conservation work. I used to do furniture conservation and, uh, in short, the European model is to try to find it as a piece of wood that is not only the same species, but the same age and same everything so that it's sort of honoring original artistic intent kind of, it's trying to match it as close as possible. Um, the American mindset is exactly opposite. It's trying to take something that is very recognizably not original because American conservators typically are, they're much more concerned about being, you know, it coming across or someday being uh, pawned off as a fake. And they don't want that. They want their repairs to be very obvious that no, this was done. Sometimes they'll even stamp it with a date in their name, the replacement component. So what I've done is I've not bothered at all to try to match it perfectly. I sometimes on the inside, I will just leave it raw. I've written a date on there, use a different species of woody. So that really helps distinguish um, that I'm not trying to fake it. Doing is, um, yeah. Yeah. is my work and is not original. So, okay, so what I'm going to do is start in with the demonstration. And Tony, at any time, if you want to just read some of the questions, that would be uh, super helpful. 
Okay, I'll do that. All right. But I, I have this little setup here. We'll see how this goes with being able to see everything. All right. So, oh, here's the, I'll show this too. This is what we're going to be doing. This was a little sample I was working through with someone. Um, so this is one that, that I put together, but it's just a quick demo. Um, and it is hard to see at this, but there's a nice tight shoulder in the front. You can see that. And then see the back, see that big gap. That's pretty typical with pre-industrial work. Now there are some people who, I mean, it, it, it's pretty tight on the back. Um, so not everyone did that all the time. You know, when you, when you ask about what they did, <laughs> what did they do back then? There is no they, uh, obviously. There's nothing, it's not, there was no textbook that everybody went through. They all did it a different way. However, this method is very common. So you'll see on the top, it's nice and tight here. And then there's a gap on the inside shoulder. Um, and that is pretty, pretty typical, pretty standard. The other thing you'll find is, um, that this then doesn't have to be 90 degrees perfectly. Um, I actually, uh, when I'm cutting the shoulder, um, the undercut, I would say is, you know, shoot for 89 degrees. <laughs> uh, it doesn't need to be extreme. We're not trying to make this radical 45 degree thing, um, but it just should definitely be less than 90. Um, and so that you can account for that here. And you'll see, maybe you've seen this on pre-industrial work. I've seen it a number of times. On the inside corner of a table, you'll see a, a big chamfer and it's just at the top. And what that designates, I believe, is opposite to the outside corner. It's the inside corner. And then you never get confused. You, you pick up the leg and it's all kind of squarish and you never have to check anything. You just look for that chamfer and you go, oh, this is the top and this is the inside corner and you, you know, you're oriented, you know where you need to be. So that's the idea here. And these pins, in this example, I just broke them off. <laughs> uh, so the pins that came through, sometimes they're, they're just sawn erratically. Sometimes they're sticking out still after 250 years. They never cut them off. They're these big, you know, pins sticking out. Sometimes they're paired off, but almost never. And sometimes they're even just hit with a hammer. They're just broken off because you can see how much thickness they've already come through. They're just kind of annoying at that point. So you just get rid of them. Um, so there are all sorts of ways you can deal with the pins on the inside, and they're all you know, pretty common. So uh, what we're going to be doing here is we're going to walk through. I have the a sample rail here, so it's smooth on this side. And even my, my smoothing plane has a little bit of a camber to it, so you can see some of that. And then on this side, you can see that tear out. So that really helps me immediately understand what is the uh, secondary service and what is the, the show face. So I'm going to be cutting a tenon on this. And then I have here uh, a little table leg sample. Again, we're just doing a little demonstration. Um, and on the inside corner, you can see this little chamfer. And this chamfer is just right there. It's just at the top. It doesn't need to be measured or long, it's just so I, I can see, when I look at the top, I can see, oh, the little chamfer is down in the bottom or whatever. Um, so that's what we're gonna be doing. All right, so the very first thing we wanna do is we wanna look at, and I'm approaching this from sort of a one-off mentality. Obviously, if you're doing a batch of tables or even one table, you kind of have it in mind how long your tendons are gonna be. What I've found is often, my tenons are about the thickness of the blade of my tri-square. Um, so I can often put my tri-square on here and I mark the bottom and that's the length of my tenon. Um, that's a really handy thing. Obviously, as you, as you tune these up, the thickness changes, but you'll see <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't matter at all. Um, it's just sort of an eyeball uh, measurement. Um, so what I'm gonna do is put, Put a mark here, and obviously you want your tenon to be less than full thickness. It's not coming through, so, and I just put a little dot. So I have my knife, and I just poke it, stab it. 
So everything I'm doing is all with a knife because what I want to do is be able to uh, stick a, a knife or an edge tool right in that spot, slide a square up to it and run my, my blade. If I have a pencil line, uh, even though you can kind of see it better, it's, it's very inefficient because then you're going to be looking and trying to line up to your square to the pencil line. So you'll see here what I'm doing. So what I will do is put the, uh, the knife right in that stab mark. It's just a little poke. And I put it right in there, set my square down. I'll show you this way so you can see what I'm doing. Set my square down and slide up to it. Now, I'm not even looking. I didn't even look at what I just did. I'm looking at you guys, right? But now I know that my square is exactly where I want it to be. So I can just make that line. So this is really efficient because now if I do this again, I know I'm again exactly right on that point. I didn't look. I had no idea. But look at that. It's right there because I can feel it. And so also I'm going to be putting a tool, an edge tool, right in that line. So this physical line is really important um, for efficiency. Um, also, what you'll find is um, you can, if you want, you can slide a mechanical pencil down into the line to kind of darken the line. Um, but even more important than that is to kill those overhead lights. You don't want overhead light for this. Because if you think about all of the surface texture that's, that you're looking at in this knife line is surface texture. See how dark that is? Unless it's a shadow. I didn't put pencil in there. But if, if we were to put this face against the window or had get overhead lighting on it, it'd be invisible. It would go away. And I think a lot of people struggle to see their lines when they have overhead lighting. You want that lighting down low. And it could be a bench lamp. If you're working in a basement or something without a window, get that bench lamp down low so you can cast a shadow so you can see all of your lines. It's not just layout lines, but it's also plane marks and all sorts of things. So, um, so that's why I'm always using natural window light. Um, so what I'm going to do is mark. That's my reference edge. I just scratched the top. So this is the top edge and my face. That's all I need. I'm all done for all my marking. So I have this laid out here. And then I have my mortise chisel for chopping and I have a mortise gauge, which is set. These are just two little pins that I drove in and I, I sharpened them and then I adjusted them with pliers so that they are dead onto this mortise. Um, this is a three eighths inch mortise chisel. Um, and so everything, the whole tenon, the mortise and tenon joint is built off of the thickness of this tool. Pre-industrial mortise chisels were not exact. Um, you can buy three eighths inch antique mortise chisels and they're all going to be a little bit different in thickness but that's immaterial because it's it's they're all going to be based off of this thing whatever this uh, dimension is so your gauge matches your tool um uh, so this is an uh what is this an ashley isles right ray isles um and so it is very precise but what i care about is that my gauge matches whatever tool i have <clears throat> So what I want to do is I want to use this to lay out the tenon. And so I'm going to, for this demonstration, ignore the fact that there's a mortise here because I want to show you how to start from the beginning. Uh, so disregard the fact that there's a mortise here. I'm going to be starting fresh. Uh, so what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be thinking, okay, scratch mark on the top. I don't know if you can see that. I have a scratch mark on the top, show face, my chamfer is the inside. I want to understand. Here we go. I want to understand exactly where I'm at. I'm always oriented outside, outside, up, up. Okay, great. And so uh, for this demonstration, what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to eyeball the reveal, the amount that, that my uh, rails face is going to be set in from the leg. Um, you can have a fixed measurement if you want. I just, for this, I'm going to just arbitrarily choose some measurement. So um, that will give me uh, a sense of how far this is going to be in. So what I'm going to do is 
take my mortise gauge. It's hard to show here in this demonstration. Um, and I'm gonna, let me set it and I'll show you in a second. So I'm gonna set the pins so that they're approximately in the center of the rail. If you're building a table, you'll wanna have all the rails all together so that you can scribe all of the, or mark all of the tenants all at the same time. So <clears throat> you wanna be ready for that because um, that'll just save you time. However, I'll show you how you can get this dimension, whatever I just set it to, you can get this again later. Um, so uh, now that I have that locked in, I can see my tenon is gonna be centered on this workpiece. I'm going to scribe off of the reference face, always off of the reference face. The other thing to note here is the end of this, you can see isn't perfectly square and I'll adjust it quick with one pair of a chisel. Um, but when you're when you're cutting this stuff, when you're cutting your all of your stock with a handsaw really quick, uh, this was actually not intended to be used for this, so that's why it's so wonky. Um, but you don't have to check that this is 90 before you start because this surface, the end grain of a tenon, never touches anything. It's completely irrelevant. It doesn't even touch the bottom of the mortise. So don't worry about this surface. So what you would not want to do is ever, ever take a, uh, a marking gauge off the end grain of a tenon and use that to scribe a shoulder. Because as soon as you start working that way, this has to be dead accurate. And this has to be, everything is really dependent on the accuracy of machinery. With this, all you need to do is have my reference edge on a square. And I don't care what's going on in the end. That doesn't matter. It'll get cleaned up. So um, that's what we're doing here. So. Off my reference face, I'm just going to scribe this tenon. And I'm not sure if you're going to be able to see this, but this is my reference face. So here's the inside. Here's the, the distance I have from the, the back interior face to the back of the tenon. And then we're going to be flipping it. So it's going to uh, change around. See here on this one, it's a lot this is broken off. This is a lot thicker here. Immaterial. It doesn't matter um, because it's the tenon is exactly the same distance from the show face. It's the same distance away. That's what we care about. So what we can do then is um, I think what I'll do first is square this off. We'll finish this. So I've laid out the tenon. I have the top. I know what the top is because of my scratch on the top. And actually... Um, one of my samples has the same thing. I've seen that really commonly. It's just a scratch on the top um, that gets buried under the tabletop. Um, so what I'm going to be doing is squaring around my line. And so my initial exterior show face shoulder, the sacred line, right? That's the one I care about. I'm going to put my knife right in that. Just make sure I have that, carry it through the very edge and I'm gonna pick up, now watch this. So to make, rather than looking at it and trying to, you know, trying to line up the square just right, instead what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put my knife in that corner, right in that edge there on the heiress. I'm gonna slide my, uh, my square right up to it. So now I know I'm right on that. So I don't have to look, I can just feel. I know now it's right on. Same thing here. And again, I want to always be referencing off my show face. You want to be thinking about the show face at all times. Because I don't know how many of you, let's say you've tried to practice um, planing a, you know, something perfectly square. And then you run, you turn it and you've got a square on it, turn it, turn it. And by the time you get around, you go, oh, that doesn't match up. It's because it's not perfectly square. But if you just designate one reference face and one reference edge, you never have to, you never have that problem because you're only referencing off at the same place. So um, on my reference edge, I'm gonna mark the back. I'm gonna 
slide down. So now all my lines are touching. They're all dead on. The knife line carries uh, consistently around. Um, so I just laid it out so it's dead on, but I'm going to adjust. I'm going to be thinking about where I cut this because I don't, some, I want to cut back. So what we're going to do before I actually cut this tenon is I'm going to transfer this. So I'm going to eyeball the distance from the show face of my rail to the, the outside show face of my leg. And I'm going to, for this demonstration, eyeball this amount of reveal. And I'm going to take my knife and stab right at one of the, the marking gauge lines. Um, you can choose whichever, but I just make a stab at one of the lines. I know it's the exterior line. So what I can do now is I can say, that's where I want the marking gauge pin to be. Because obviously I can't use the same measurement because I'm setting it in. So I need to adjust, add the reveal into this setting. So what I'm going to do then is loosen this and drop this pin in that mark and make sure I, my, my gauge line uh, needs to be long enough uh, so that is at least longer than my rail. And typically the gauge lines do run longer than the rail. Um, but I'm going to add a, about an inch, at least an inch, inch and a quarter up at the top um, so that there's there's this horn material. That'll get cut off later, but it's important when you're chopping a mortise, you have that. So what I'm going to do is I have my new gauge setting where I've added the reveal amount in, and I'm going to scribe that. I don't know if you can see that. The other thing that I will point out with all of my marking, my, my gauging and things, is I do believe it's really important to learn um, to use, you know, you want to use gauges in a slow, steady motion, progressively deeper, but you want to be doing it in a very confident, controlled way. Um, and you want to learn how to do that freehand. Um, and so if you're just starting out, you might want to put it in a vice, you know, and just kind of you have control that way. But what I found is a lot of people struggle holding it like this and, and trying to keep it regular. I often will, you'll see this, this bench hook here, or the side rest it's called sometimes. I will butt it up here and I will put it into my gut or something. I'll hold it that way and I can just scribe it really quick. And then I can flip it around and go this way. And I can make quick adjustments. So vices um, are great uh, for a few things, but most things they're not. They're too slow. If you're going to sit there and crank it in there and tighten it and then make your mark and then loosen it and turn it around, put it in, tighten it, make your mark, it, you're going to be spending all day and then hand tools are going to be slow. So uh, you want to be able to, uh, I will often push something up against the wall here. I will use against my, my bench hook, my planing stop. I'll put my weight into that and make a mark against this right here. So everything I'm doing, I'm, I'm being able to use my body weight to make, you know, like a half second clamp action. I just want to lock it down, make my mark and move on. That is a real uh, key to efficiency with pre-industrial work. So I would, I would encourage you guys to learn that, to get, to practice that, be able to do marking gauge stuff and just use your body. Woodworking is a very physical full body thing. I have my feet spread wide right now. Um, a lot of people think of woodworking is just a hand thing. Um, but I find that uh, people who think of it just with only in the hands, they end up struggling quite a bit, especially with, with the physicality of, of hand tools. So um, what I would say, so first you, you have this scratched out, this factors in the reveal. And so I'm checking my orientation and I can check. Okay, I line those up and say, yep, so that's going to be the reveal that I want. I'm happy with that. Okay. So what I will do then is I will mark my mortise for right now. So once these are all, I'll do all my tenons all together, finish them. Then I'll figure out what my gauge setting needs to be for my legs. And then I'll do all of those eight mortises. Um, 
so I can have everything laid out and done. And then it's just a matter of cutting, chopping, and then I can just fit them. And they'll all be fit to each other custom just to make sure, you know, because none of us are perfect. Um, but that way the layout is all consistent and you're not getting confused and you're not having to change the gauge setting all the time. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to lay this on here and I'm going to be making three lines, three marks, and they should be pretty obvious because you're going to say, okay, I'm going to make sure I have my horn. I have an inch, inch and a quarter or something. And I'm going to make the top mark. It's the top of the rail and the bottom of the rail. That's easy. Okay. So top and bottom. And I don't actually know what this measurement is, but I know it will fit perfectly because it, I've just marked it right off the piece. And with pre-industrial work, I'm never really measuring anything. The only reason I would measure or use a ruler or numbers are, is if I'm trying to reproduce a piece for you know, some museum that wants it exactly what this historic particular artifact is. Otherwise, I can, I mean, I might say I want four inch rails. Okay, you can decide that, that's great but I would just make your four inch rails and then move on and just have everything laid out to whatever that arbitrary measurement is. So don't be thinking in terms of numbers. As soon as numbers, you start adding numbers, you're gonna get lost because you're trying to use sort of um, almost like, a, like an engineering mentality with this kind of layout and it's gonna get really confusing. So I have the top mark and the bottom mark. And then because I don't want my tenon to go up through the top of the rail, uh, where'd that go? This was that little sample. You can see how the mortise doesn't come all the way up through. The tenon doesn't come all the way up. And that's the haunch. That's the material that's cut away from the tenon. So I just need to lay out how far my tenon is below this. Like this. See how the tenon doesn't go all the way up to the top. It's cut down lower so that the top of the leg can be cut flush. And there's, there's still meat there. So what I'm going to be doing is first I'll just uh, use a square off the outside reference face and mark the top of the rail and mark the bottom of the rail. And then the amount of haunch really doesn't matter. It really can be by eye because at this point I'm now designating this tenon fits this rail. They're all going to be matched up. Um, and so you can I always eyeball something like three eighths of an inch. I mean, it, it's that's enough. You don't want uh, a crazy amount. You don't want just a sliver. You want about three eighths of an inch, but I never measure it. I just stab right there, three eighths down from the top line, slide the square up and scribe that. So I have one top, bottom, and then three eighths down. So I'm going to be sawing at the top one. So my mortise has to stop at, at the one below. I don't want to chop my mortise all the way up to the top. And I always have students go all the way up to the top. So what I would say is if you're not used to this method of layout and chopping with a chisel, you kind of get carried away and excited and it's easy to just get all the way up to the top line. So if you need to, you know, somehow put a mark there saying, don't chop this or, or only maybe the waste that you're going to be chopping, you can color that in with a pencil so you can remind yourself not to go to the top line. Um, I wish I didn't have to say that so, so much, but every class I have someone go all the way up and they go, oh, whoops. Um, so just a, a thing to keep in mind. Uh, we we want to keep going. Um, so now that we have all everything marked out, um, I'll show you this, uh, this cutting of the tenon first. Uh, so I have my deep knife line here up at, on the show face and everything else is, is running uh, exactly in line with that. The knife line carries around all four nice and tight. They're not misaligned at all. Um, and I will again, off my reference edge, use my square and slide up and just make sure that my knife line is nice and deep, as deep as you can reasonably get it with your knife. And then I'm going to create a little trough because I want, because this is the sacred line. I don't want to be putting a saw 
on my sacred line because saws don't leave nice clean lines, knife, knives do. So what I'm gonna be doing then is putting the chisel, you guys have probably seen this before, just creating a little V groove on the waist side. So on the tenon, the waist here, I'm gonna create a little V groove. So that there's the knife line and then up from that is this waist I'm removing. And that enables me to stick my saw plate down into that groove so that my saw is below the surface. So I'll keep this right here, I'll lock it in. I'm not gonna put it in a vise and I'm gonna use this chisel, the, the corner of the chisel to guide it forward. And what I've found, I'm just gonna show you here the orientation. Um, you can see my chisel is skewed. I'm not pushing toward my hand, right? I'm not pushing that way. I'm pushing forward, but it's skewed. And I'm using my thumb to ensure that that is the case. That's what's making, that's where all the, the muscles coming for this cut, it's forward. It's, it's hard to show here, but. I'm gonna have to turn, I can't really do this. So uh, I'm gonna skew the chisel and go forward. And I've loosened those chips. I'm gonna brush them away. And now I have a little V trough. And depending on how the hardness of the wood, you know, this is just, just pine for this demonstration. Um, but depending on the hardness of the wood, you might have to do another pass. I typically do a second pass but it's so quick that it's not a big deal. Okay, so can you see that maybe? I'm trying to, okay. So I have a, a knife shoulder and I have this waist that's removed. So that way I can set my saw blade, my saw plate down inside of that. So now it's just a matter of sawing down to the tenon. It should be just a few strokes, but what we're gonna be doing is make sure, watch that sacred edge. And I'm gonna draw back just to make sure I have a nice firm curve. And so what I'm gonna be doing is sawing not at 90 degrees, but at a little more. I mean, I, I say 89 degrees or 85 degrees, nothing crazy, just a little bit tilted. So that way, you know, it's gonna be fitting at the, the sacred edge first and everywhere else, um, you know, can fit later if it's nice and tight, but it doesn't have to. You wanna prioritize the fit at the outside edge. So now that I'm below my, my sacred surface, I'm down underneath, I just... Cut down to my tenon. I'm just gonna go a little bit. Okay, so that's that one. So I have a nice, tight, sacred edge. And uh, you can see that it's not a 90 degree cut, it's undercut a little bit, just like we saw in that sample. Now, um, I did see a comment, but let me quick do this other thing and then we can look at that comment, that question, Tony. But here's the inside, here's the inside surface. And I've said, that's not sacred. That's not uh, something that needs to be nice and crisp, right? And we also want it to be out of the way. So what we wanna do with that is instead of trying to create that nice V so we can have a clean edge, to, to avoid that and to also take more than enough away, I will stick my saw plate right on that knife line. So half of the, the, um, the set, half of the kerf is gonna be past the line. That's ideal, that's, very, that's a very small amount, but that's just enough to give you enough room. So I will just, on the inside rail, I'll set my saw plate right on the, um, the back knife line. I'll start my top and bottoms. Now that I'm established, I can just go down to the tenon. Okay, so you're not gonna be able to see it, I'm sure, but um, it's a subtle, it's a subtle amount below the line. It's hard to see from this, but 
Yeah. So Tony, what was that question that just popped up? Can you comment on the origin of your scribing knife? On my what knife? The scribing knife. Oh, sc scribing. Okay. Um, it is a file that I, that I stuck on a grinder and put it on a piece of wood and I just keep it on my hip. Uh, I just made it. Um, it is, it's, it's not like some special, um, you know, single, uh, uh, what do they call those? Like oh, this striking knife that is like sing single bevel or whatever. Whatever. Um, it's not one of those. It's double bevel. And in fact, I find that much more useful. And, and you can, you basically, if you reference, if you just bump up, I'm always touching the bottom edge of my square or whatever. If I'm scribing dovetails, I just make sure I'm touched up right on that bottom point and scribe. So it's just a regular knife. I mean, there's, there's nothing about it that's special whatsoever. Um, so I, I've tried to use the striking knives and I just, I put them away and just get my little knife on my hips. So I like that. Um, <clears throat> so what I'm going to do is bring you around to the vise. This is basically the only operation that I use the vise. It's for sawing the tendon, uh, out the cheeks. So... Okay, so to saw this out, you'll see that this is crooked because I want to be sawing two surfaces, these two. I want to be sawing this way and that way. Um, <clears throat> and so I have my, my tenon saw for that, um, and I'm going to be sawing uh, just leaving half of the knife line. That's what I'm visualizing. Um, but there's, there's a little technique for starting that's it's kind of tricky. So I'll use my, my thumb just like always, and I'll put it, I'll show you this in a second. I'll put it just outside of the knife line where I want it to be. But as you know, a big heavy tenon saw on the very edge of the board, it's gonna be pretty hard to start that and to make sure it doesn't veer off to the side, right? So the way that I can avoid that, some people will take a little, they'll take their knife and they'll just they'll carve a little V right there so that they can set their saw down in it, just like we did with the shoulder. And that's fine, it just requires, you know, kind of put your, it's picky, right? So what I like to do is just create a little trench that's faster. And so I'll put my, my saw right on where I want it to be, and I'll just pull backwards, a quick little pull. And it's not straight, it's just creating a little, a little hole, a place for me to, <clears throat> that little saw curve. So I can start right in that spot. So now I'm just going to saw this line and that line, and I'm not going to saw what I can't see. I'm going to stop as soon as I get to this, this edge. I just, <clears throat> I saw a friend of mine, he works at Williamsburg in the, in the hay shop and he had a mask on and he, <laughs> and he was trying to blow the, the sawdust away and it wasn't working. I don't know. So what I'm going to do, um, so I just, I saw it right here. You now you can see that's what I just took away. Now I'm going to do the back side since I'm here. I made, you can see my quick little curve. Now I know I'm gonna be dead on with that line. Okay, <clears throat> so I'm gonna flip it. And now what's great is I've already started my curve on the back, of course, because it went past, it just a touch past. And so I'm gonna, I already have, oops. I have this curve already established and I already have the top line square. So it's just a matter of carrying it down. And 
to stop there. And then to finish it, I'm just going to square it up. And the reason it's tilted is just because that way I'm not having to tilt my saw and, you know, saw it down like that. It just keeps my saw plate, you know, horizontal. Uh, so this is the inside face. And so I'm going to hold on to this piece. This is going to fall off from the cheek. It's the cheek waist. So I'm just going to hold on to that as I come down to meet the shoulder line. And that's that. And I'm going to flip it around to do the same for the show cheek. So now I have to be thinking about my sacred edge. I don't want to mar that. I don't want to mess that up. So really nothing else is too crucial. Just that one line that helps me focus on what's important. Okay. And while it's in the vise, since I have it here, I like to just grab a chisel and any little bit of waste at the very bottom of the cut, if there's anything there, I just make a quick swipe to get rid of it. Okay. So I'll bring it back over here to the, the bench. <coughs> Um, okay, so I like using a two inch chisel for this because my, you know, my tendon is pretty wide. If I were to use a smaller chisel, that's not, it's just, you're going to be having to cover a wide area. So uh, now on my show surface, this is my show surface. I don't want to go past my knife line, past my gauge lines. I've gauged those things. And that exterior line is the reference line. It's referenced off of that. So if I need to thin my tenon, I need to take it off the back side, right? Otherwise it's gonna move my tenon. I don't wanna move it. That's the line and I, I thin it out from the back side. So as I'm pairing, if there's anything I need to pair nice and flush, it's only gonna to be to the, that exterior line. But I try to saw you know, right to the line. So it's really just spot pairing. Okay, and so now the back side I can touch up. And that was just a little bit of material. Obviously, I'm not fitting it right now, I'm just getting it to my lines. So, the next thing to do is chopping the mortise. Um, and I'll show you how I do this down at the um, the, the saw bench, or some, some people have been calling them Roman benches because of Christopher Schwartz, he was building them. Um, but it's just a low bench, but it's nice and long. It's not like a typical saw bench. Um, so Tony, what's that question as I get set up here? Okay, uh, what are you using for a camera and are you mic'd up? Uh, well, I have an iPad and I'm not mic'd. Okay, working pretty well. I assume the camera means this camera, not yeah. typically. Yeah. Okay, so let me lower this. Let me lower it a little more. Do you have that on a tripod or? Yeah, I do. And I have to lower it enough so you can see what I'm doing. One second.
<laughs> okay, I think that'll work for what I'm doing. Okay, so with this, um, I chop all my mortises on this bench. It's just a long, low bench. It's only knee high. Um, but this helps me because I'll, I'll bring, as I'm doing this chopping, I want you to see the, the wide shot, but then I'll show you where I'm starting with it. Um, so the chopping is just in this V orientation. It's down this way, down this way and clearing. Um, but because I have my body, I'm sitting on top of the workpiece. This is my, this is my clamp. <laughs> it's, I'm just sitting down on it. Um, and that way, when I'm doing the chopping, I can pick it up, tap the material out, adjust, flip. Um, and so I find that a lot faster than trying to clamp it down at the workbench. Uh, a lot of people are chopping their mortises up on their high bench and they're standing up over it doing this. And it's really, I just find it to be very tiring and it's awkward because you can't be on top of it. So if you want to be sighting down 90 degrees to make sure your, your mortise is square, you have to be leaned over your bench to be, to check it. And this orientation down on top of it, I have an oval handle and I'm sighting straight down. And so I have no questions about whether I'm square or not. I can see, I'm just sitting right on top of it. So what I'm gonna do, I'll show you this in a second, but I'm just gonna start. And I'm gonna start with the mortise uh, at, at this end of the mortise near me, because right now this looks pretty comfortable, right? Doing this, my first chop. Okay, but now I gotta turn it around chop this way, which is kind of awkward. So, that's my line. This is the bottom of my line. I'm starting just a quarter of an inch nearest me, and then I'm gonna work my way up away from me. And so now I'm gonna back up about a quarter of an inch and clear that, back up another eighth of an inch. And only in this first, this first kind of, the first two inches, I would say, is it pretty critical to be, you wanna be really careful because you're guiding, basically the top surface, once you establish where you're gonna put the chisel, it's just gonna kind of ride that, just like a saw curve. So uh, it's important that you're really careful about your placement, but then once you get down into the mortise, it's a lot easier to guide it straight. So what I'm gonna be doing is just backing up about an eighth of an inch every time, and I'm gonna pop. So the, the mortise chisel is a, is a cutting tool, but it's also a prying tool. That's why it's so thick, so you can pry without the edge breaking. So I'm gonna back up another eighth of an inch, and every time, I'm not only going an eighth of an inch farther away, but I'm going deeper and deeper and deeper every time. Pop it up, and I'll do a few more, and then I'll show you my progress so you can see it up close. The other thing I found is some people um, get really sore doing this, their hands, and it's because they're death gripping this chisel really hard because they're thinking, I get, this is a lot of work and I'm going to really hold on tight. And, and they're putting all of that strain right into their wrist. And that's brutal. It really hurts. So this is just to hold it still. You should not be really feeling any pressure driving through. So I'm just steering. I'm, I'm, I can hold this with two fingers. So if you have a sore wrist from doing this, you're not doing it right. So you can see here my, my progress. And the, the first inch is a little slow because you're trying to get as deep as possible really quickly. And once you get down to depth, about you know halfway, you should be pretty close to depth. Then you can just cruise through, just finish it up. Um, and you'll see here, I don't know if you can see, oh yeah, look at that. So, um, cause this is a, there's another tenon here, like in a table, you would have that tenon. Um, the depth of my mortise is going to be this amount. 
from the other tenon. So I'm not going to try to chop down below that because there's going to be a tenon coming in. And those two tenons will just be mitered so that they don't bump into each other. So I already have my depth established here. But if, um, if I'm trying to figure out how deep I am, and I, I can't really see, and I'm looking down in the mortise, and I say, how deep am I? I can't tell. What I'll do is I'll slide my knife to the very bottom of the mortise and pinch, and then I can pick this up and set it on the outside and go, oh, okay, I can see my depth. That gives me a quick little gauge uh, to be able to check my progress without measuring it. So what I'll do here is uh, just take a minute and finish this mortise real quick, a minute or two maybe. And then I'll be able to slide the tenon in. Um, this is pine, so it's soft. So obviously the harder the wood, the more work it is. Um, but even, <coughs> even in hardwoods, it's not, it's really not that bad. Um, especially the bigger your mallet is, the faster you can go. And some people who struggle with this feel like they want to have a smaller mallet but you're only asking for more work because the smaller your mallet, the harder you have to hit. The bigger your mallet, all you have to do is, you know, pick it up and let its weight do the work. So a bigger mallet is a lot easier. And by bigger, I mean heavier. <laughs> so I'm almost to the end here. And because the top, the very top of the mortise is going to be hidden, of course, under the table, I can just pry right on that edge because it's totally going to be covered by the rail. Once the rail is assembled, you won't see that I, I was prying on that. But I do want to show you this that at the very top of the mortise, you won't be able to see, but that is not 90 degrees. It's again, undercut. Everything's always undercut. Because if, you, if you're not a machine that can do 90, you should make sure you're not doing too much. Or, you know, I don't want the, the mortise gonna be tapering in so my tenon gets stuck uh, more and more as it goes down. I'd rather undercut it. So now with the horn, this, the horn's getting cut off. So I can use this to tap out the chips. Critical to always be blowing all the chips away because otherwise it's going to be right in your way. So at the bottom of the mortise, although 17th century work, you know, Peter Follinsby, if you know him, he does 17th century work. <clears throat> and he, he'll just pry on the top and the bottom of the mortise because that's what 17th century work, apparently it's much more typical. In 18th century work, the bottom of the mortise, where the, if you're looking under a table and you see the rail coming in, very it's not very common that they're actually were prying on that. They nice they like to leave it nice and crisp. And so what I'm gonna do is do that and I'll show you how in a second here. I'm just going back down to the bottom of the mortise to, to catch up to where I went all the way up to the top. And I do find it handy to have a little knife along so I can just pull out the chips that aren't popping. I'm almost done with this. So I'm, I'm about, I would say about an eighth of an inch from the bottom line. And so I'm gonna start making sure right now what I've chopped is quite angled and I wanna make sure it's pretty much at least 90 degrees so I can bring it down. So I need to uh, steepen that angle. So right now I have 
maybe a sixteenth left. You're not going to be able to see that on this funny camera, but I have about a sixteenth left away from the line, and then my mortise will be done. Um, so I'm really, really close. But if I just, as you know, when you have the, the bevel of the chisel and you put it right in your line, as you drive it, the bevel is going to push it past your line, which would not be ideal. So the way that I avoid that is I set, I set the chisel right in the line. I have only a sixteenth of an inch left. I put the chisel right in there and then I tilt it really hard and I just give it a little tap and it just throws a little shoulder. So you're only you're making, you're just taking the top little tiny sliver off and that gives you enough to be a little shelf that you can go down below the surface. Um, so if that makes sense, I can explain it again if someone has a question, but I'll do it real quick. So I'm, I'm only about a 16th from the bottom of the line. I set my chisel right in that line. I want this to be nice and crisp and I just give it a tiny little tap. That's it. So that just knocked a little sliver off the top of that last 16th. And now I have a little tiny shelf that I can set my chisel down onto and go straight down. And that's it. So that's the mortise. Um, it's gonna be hard to see, but so that's a crisp line and this was pried against. Um, and so what we'll do to finish up here is I'll show you how I cut the haunch and just do the quick fitting. Um, and then we can take any, any questions. And I mean, if you want, I can, I could do the pins too, but, um, let me first, let's finish up the, the tenon. I'm going to set that right there. So to measure the haunch, to measure the haunch, I'm going to put the bottom of the mortise in here. I'm going to lay it right down so I can see where the haunch line is and just take my knife and just do a quick little stab. Now, actually, I'm going to, I'm going to do that on the outside. It'll be easier to see this way. So I'm on the, uh, the show face of my tenon. I just make a little knife stab, put it in the vise, and now I can see my sacred edge I want to watch out for. And I'm just going to saw 90 degrees by eye down and not scarring my sacred edge. And that's that. Again, thinking about my sacred edge. All right, and then fitting. Sometimes it slides right in, sometimes it's often is a little snug. And so to do the adjustments, I, I can use my two inch chisel and see where it's fitting tight. <clears throat> Almost there. So what I'm going to do before I, it's really close here, is I'm just going to um, 
chamfer. I don't know about the depth. I haven't checked that. Um, I'm going to modify the depth it's just a touch long, but the bottom of that isn't going to touch anyway. So. Okay. So that I can see that will not touch at the bottom of the mortise, which is great. And then lastly, I will put a big chamfer or, you know, not a, maybe a, an eighth of an inch chamfer, top and bottom, just to ease that. And also sometimes the bottom of the mortise can have junk in it, the edges. So you want to be able to clear the tenon so it can seat down. And then I'll do the top and bottom. So everything is nice and chamfered, rounded over. Joshua? Yep. Would you ever use a lock mortise chisel? to clean out the bottom of the mortise, or was no. that done in pre-industrial joinery? No, uh, part of my French, but all the bottom of those mortises, they look like hell. They're terrible. They're really bad. Um, so the bottom of it ends up, if you look at, um, if you've seen like conservation work or uh, historians um, work where they've x-rayed the joinery, you'll see the bottom of the mortises, they're all, they look like mountain peaks. And it's because the bottom of the chisel just and because nothing is touching there, it's not a glue surface. So don't spend any time on the bottom of the mortise. Uh, you just want it out of the way. Um, so they're, they're all like that, they're crazy. Okay, uh, one other question. Uh, someone asked um, the, you to put the title of your latest book, which is Drawing the Bench Guide to Furniture Joinery. I believe that's available on your website. It is, yep, on mortisontenandmag.com. Okay. Let's just see if I can get this to go. So in terms of fit, you want to fit that. Um, you can see there's no way this is coming apart. Um, but I also don't want to crack anything. So you have to factor in the hardness of your wood. And if it's a, a wood that's prone, uh, prone to splitting. So you want to factor that in, but you want it tight. If, you're, if your joint falls together, that's, it's too loose. Um, so what you can see here is it's nice and tight. There's no glue or even any pins yet. Um, but let's see if you can see that. See how that's like a knife fit, super nice and tight, right? And if you look at the top, do you see that difference in the inside? And the inside has the gap there. Now this is super, super strong. Um, and uh, this is what pre-industrial work looks like. When you get with your flashlight, if you see some antique pieces, put your head under there and you'll look and you'll say, oh, there's a big gap on the inside. That's weird. Uh, this guy didn't know what he was doing, but no, he knew exactly what he was doing. Um, it's super tight, super rugged. The inside shoulder has no uh, structural bearing of any significant note at all. It's just a piece of furniture. It's not a building or something, you know. So, um, are there any other questions about that? Okay, I hope there's, there's nothing on chat. Uh, I had a question though. You, the um, joint you showed right in the beginning looked like it had some, um, yeah, it did have some pegs in it uh, for uh, draw, uh, yep. drawing the tenon closed. Um, yeah. Could you comment on that, or, or yeah, I could. <laughs> so, what I would do, um, maybe the easy, maybe if you guys got five more minutes, you want me to show you real quick? Sure. I mean, that might be the easiest because I'd have to explain it. It'd take longer to explain it. So, um, what we're doing is a drawboard joint, which probably many of you are familiar with. But what draw boring is, is you have the hole in the tenon and the hole in the leg, but they're actually misaligned. They don't match up so that it gets nice and tight. And so what you want to do uh, to, put, for, to put the pins in is, I'll do one real quick here. 
So when you bore the pins, you first bore the leg first. Where are they? All right. Oops, right here. And then, so that's what broke through the, the inside. And then you slide. You put the tenon in, and you, there's no way on earth you're gonna be able to see this on the camera, but you're just gonna to have to trust me. Uh, what I'm gonna be doing is marking not the very center of the hole, but I'm gonna look down and mark in toward the shoulder. That's the key phrase, in toward the shoulder, in toward the shoulder, because you're intentionally misboring, <laughs> intentionally misaligning the holes. So I'm gonna be looking in, And now I just put a, a, a point here on the tenon, but in toward the shoulder. And if you think about it in terms of a third of the, the diameter of the hole, so you see the two holes overlapping by a third, that's a rule of thumb that works. So now that I've marked the tenon, the center of the hole, don't put your chin, when you're pulling these out, I hit myself in the chin one time and not a good move. So now, uh, now that I have this center point marked. And there's a question on what type of bit are you using? Oh, um, this is an antique spoon bit, uh -huh. but for, it's just for boring a hole. So, you know, whatever bit makes you happy, is, it's not a, doesn't functionally change much. Um, so now these two holes, Yep, you're, you're not gonna be able to see it. It's too small, but you can see that a, a sliver of like a, ha a sliver of a moon there because they don't perfectly line up because the tenon's hole is in toward the shoulder. Um, so when I drive a pin, where did my mouth go? Yes. <clears throat> This is oak, or actually this piece is ash. Because it's nice and straight grain. So all of your pins need to be straight grain. I mean, if you're not gonna split them, uh, you should be sawing them so they follow the grain line. Um, they're gonna be small and you have to have a lot of strength. Um, so to make the pin, Oh, actually, it's right. I have two size bits. This is this. I split it up. It's probably too small. We'll see. So you can see I have this little uh, shelf here that I use in my vise. And I keep my fingers nice and back because this is a lot of weight. I'm not putting my whole body weight. And then if I fall, I have a big chisel here. I'm just leaning into this just with the chisel and I'm making it an octagon. If you were to use a, a dowel plate, you would have to do all this work to get it close to be able to drive it into the, the dowel plate anyways. But most of the pre-industrial pins, I mean, a lot of them, some of them are round, but most of them are square or six sided or seven sided. They're all just kind of random sizes. So now that I have my pin roughly shaped to size, there's a very slight taper to it, but you can tell I'm not measuring the taper. It's just kind of whatever's convenient. And I'll put a little point on it so that because the holes are not aligned, I want to be able to snake in to meet that hole. So, yep. So now, let's see, where are you gonna see? So I'm gonna, I had the pin just started inside of that. You can hear that thud, that thud. And that is now totally locked together. 
So um, all you'd have to do then is saw that flush and pair it on the outside nice and clean. And on the inside, I've seen these just left like that. It's kind of crazy. It looks like vampires. You also could saw them, smack them off, whatever. Because once there's glue on that and the pin, um, everything is, is nice and tight. So what that does, that draw bore pin, it, it, because they're misaligned, it's just sucking that shoulder in so tight, more than it actually wants to. So now this, I showed you that was tight, but now it's really tight um, and it will remain so. So that's a draw bore joint. That's a really powerful way to, to make a table without any clamps. Um, and it's actually even more strong. So it's a nuisance to take apart. <laughs> when you're doing conservation work, man, they're strong. They're really strong and you gotta be careful. So uh, it's bomb proof. <laughs>